So is AI a friend or a foe in improving drug development and equity of patient access to medical innovations and clinical trials, do you think? I mean, I think AI is a game changer for these complex, rare cancers. Um, we have a fair amount of genomic information now from uh, clinical trials such as the Zero Child Cancer Initiative, um, from profiling tumours in the lab, but also measuring the response of these tumours to certain therapeutics that have been optimised for treatment for this disease. Now, there's many precision medicine clinical trials going on around the world, but we never have an indication of which patients are going to respond. So I think AI and um, training deep learning models using um, informatics, genomics, methylation, as, also, as well as drug screening will provide us with the patients that are most likely to respond and may even give us indication of how long these patients are going to respond so that we know when a, tr a drug is going to fail the patient and we can reposition the next best therapy to try and prolong survival. Yeah, okay, so you think it can do things you know, much quicker, I suppose, than we could do it today? At the moment, we don't really have an understanding of when a drug's going to fail. We, we, in the lab, we test these drugs and they work tremendously, and then we go to clinical trials, and we're unsure of when a patient's progressing because of our limited ability to measure the tumour that's within the brainstem. So the only way to really look at the tumour is MRI, and MRI imaging in DIPG, for example, is terrible. These tumours don't take up contrast, which is the, 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 the molecule that's taken up by the tumour to show where it is. And so you never really get a clear picture of how a patient's responding. So we think that using AI and training models will help us to predict when a patient's going to fail their therapy and we can reposition the next best therapy. Yeah. And so I guess considering the benefits of circulating tumour DNA, what are the barriers to this not becoming a standard option um, for regular ongoing surveillance and how can we overcome some of those barriers? In brain cancers, circulating tumour DNA has been detected, but the amount that's detected is very rare and very limited. And at, at the moment, we haven't been able to robustly collect cell-free DNA and use that as a predictive marker for either diagnostic or responsive therapy. It's a different story when we look at the patient's cerebral spinal fluids. We see much more cell-free DNA, and you can imagine the tumours bathed in this fluid that's in the central nervous system. That's a much more robust measurement um, of uh, how a patient's responding to therapy. Almost we need to change the way that we care for our patients and, and provide patients with Amaya catheters that, that directly access the CSF to stop patients from having to have, have uh, painful lumbar punctures to measure minimal de residual disease or to monitor tumour progression in real time. So I think there is a place for circulating DNA, but not necessarily in the plasma or in the blood, but more in the, the CSF fluid that's, that surrounds the tumour. Yeah, okay. And um, I guess as we've already asked you today, but if you can sum up in you know, a sentence or two, what does a better world for rare mean to you? So we've, we've, we tackle rare, rare cancers and we have early phase trials but I think the trials that we have at the moment are only phase one trials. So we need to be able to uh, adjust these trials in an adaptive way. Um, so rather than having a concrete trial plan that's um, unchangeable throughout that trial duration, if we have more adaptive trials uh, that can use things like Bayesian statistics, we can change the trials in real time when new evidence comes to light. So we don't have to start brand new trials to make slight modifications to trials and we can still get useful data to, see, to show whether these drugs are safe, uh, whether the regimens are, um, are appropriate, and then to get minimal um, survival benefit information out of those trials without having to start brand new trials, which we all know takes forever, is expensive, and really becomes unfeasible. Yep. And then very last question, um, we are just chatting out there before, this is your first CAN Forum. Why do you think events like CAN Forum are, you know, so important for the sector? It's important to get patients together that are facing these rare diseases, um, thinking about things in a more holistic way, um, bringing patients together and providing access to medicines outside of the traditional standard of care paradigm that all treatment for cancer is currently given. I think means that we will move the, the, the dial towards improved outcomes more quickly. Um, it brings together expertise, it brings together patients' experience, and it helps us design the trials of the future that take into the consideration all of the challenges that people face, all of the challenges that people have lived, and makes us design a healthcare system that's more equitable for all.